So welcome, everybody. Thank you for being with us. Uh, we're also live streaming today's discussion. Adele, we're all set? Fantastic. I'm Richard Ponzio uh, from the Stimson Center on behalf of Stimson and the United Nations Association local chapter here, the National Capital Area Chapter, as we're called. Uh, very pleased to welcome you to today's discussion on the diplomacy of decolonization, United Nations peacekeeping during the Congo crisis, 1960 to 64. This will be a sneak preview uh, as the book will come out in the next few weeks uh, by our friend and a wonderful scholar, uh, Dr. Alana O'Malley, who's with us today to give us an overview. And very pleased that uh, my colleague, uh, Bill Dirge, here at the Stimson Center uh, will serve as a discussant to help kick off uh, and, and provoke what we think will be a very rich and stimulating discussion about a really important set of issues. Because as people know, uh, Congo, um, one of the first major UN operations. So we'll certainly be talking about peacekeeping and, and the lessons and insights for peace operations today. It was also, um, you know, the, the height, uh, the beginning of the period of decolonization, uh, as it's very clearly illustrated in the title of the book, but also great pow power politics during the Cold War. Uh, so many important themes that we can learn from, and we're so delighted to um, have uh, Professor Amali with us. Before I do a formal uh, introduction, and, and, but you do have biographical details in front of you, as well as an announcement about uh, the book and how you can order a copy in the coming weeks. Um, let me first uh, welcome our executive director of the UNA National Capital Area Chapter, Paula Bolan, to give us uh, an update about the chapter, how you can become involved in uh, activities uh, on a range of issues uh, coming up later this year. Paula. Thank you very much, Richard, and thank you to the Stimson Center. Um, this is not the first time that we are collaborating, um, and we're delighted that Richard uh, has joined the UNANCA Board of Directors. So thank you very much for inviting us to collaborate for today's program. For those of you who might not be very familiar with UNANCA, we're one of the largest and most active of 180 chapters in the United States. And we serve the District of Columbia, Northern Virginia, and Maryland with about 1,200 members and very active um, group of volunteers. Uh, our mission is to promote productive U.S. involvement in the international community. We do that uh, by educating and mobilizing our members and supporters uh, for a strong U.S.-U.N. partnership. And this is done through a number of committees uh, run by volunteers. I'd like to start with the one that uh, Richard and our past president, Ambassador Bliss, who is here with us today, chair the Peace and Security Committee. Um, and we also have uh, committees on human rights, international law, um, sustainable development, um, African affairs. We have a very active group of young professionals. I know we have someone, some young professionals and students in the audience today and some live stream as well. So consider joining UNANCA if you are not yet a member because you get access to these committees, you can volunteer your time, you can uh, learn from others um, in the fields uh, that you're interested in, you can find wonderful mentoring opportunities and professional development. Our young professionals just had a, a series of career dinners this past Sunday, Saturday, sorry, and uh, there's much more to come. Um, so we're pretty active during the fall. There's several events coming up. Uh, we are uh, planning a quite substantive program with the U.S. Um, Institute of Peace, uh, likely to happen at the end of November, and you'll hear more about it. It's going to focus on U.N. reform, peacekeeping reform. And on December the 7th, we're going to commemorate our annual Human Rights Awards, um, and Human Rights Award uh, Day, and uh, we have um, outstanding honorees this year, including the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Prince uh, Al Hussein of Jordan, who will be getting our Louis Bisson Award, among others. So stay tuned, check us out, and stay engaged. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. So an action-packed program to be a part of just this fall and, and throughout the course of this next year. And uh, yes, I'm delighted as a member of the peace and security uh, team for UNA uh, NCA to be uh, having this opportunity to partner with uh, here at the Stimson Center, uh, where I uh, direct the Just Security uh, program, which Bill Dirch, who will be our discussant today, is also a member. But let me um, 
we'll just give the biographical details of one key person, our featured guest today, uh, Professor Amali, who, uh, as many of you know, is a professor of international history at uh, Leiden University in the Netherlands. Uh, we're very fortunate to have her here, uh, not just today, but over the next several months as a Fulbright research scholar at the history department of GW here in town. Um, she previously was a visiting scholar at New York University in 2009 and has come from uh, a fellowship in uh, Sydney, Australia uh, earlier this year. So this book that we'll be hearing about today will be published in uh, a couple of weeks from now with Manchester University Press. You have details uh, on uh, before you. And we very much um, welcome not only um, questions you may have based on the uh, remarks you're about to hear, but uh, yeah, your own thoughts and insights about this important period, uh, not only in, in global history, but in, in the UN's work in its earliest days, uh, shortly after the UN's creation. And of course, we know peacekeeping was invented just a few years before uh, the term uh, put forward by Lester Pearson in the, in the 1950s. So with that said, we'll hear from uh, Professor O'Malley and then uh, Dr. Dirch and, and from all of you. Welcome once again, Alana. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, for that very generous introduction. And thank you very much to the Simpson Center and to the UNMCA for this very kind invitation to present my book, which is the first chance I've had actually to talk about it since I finished it uh, during the summer. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk for about 15 minutes and just give you a brief overview of what the book tries to do, um, what the Congo crisis was, although I presume that many of you are familiar with that since you're here. Um, and then really why it's important that we look back at this moment now um, in this period where there is a current debate going on about UN reform, about the merits and the perils of peacekeeping, but also about the kind of world order that we want the UN to try to construct. Um, and that's what the book tries to do. It, it tries to take one moment uh, in history um, and to suggest that this is where we see the UN actively being used as a forum but also activating its own agency in constructing a particular world order between uh, the states of the Global North and Global South. So to kind of give you um, a brief introduction, um, I'm just going to talk very quickly for a few minutes about what the Congo crisis actually was. Um, the Congo, of course, uh, continues to be um, besieged, if you like, by internal disputes between various warring parties by um, dubious claims of regional and provincial sovereignty, by the interference of its neighbors and many other more far-flung states, such as China and the United States, in its political affairs due to the control of vast amounts of strategic materials and raw resources that it has. Um, and this has really been the story of the Congo since the late 19th century, um, when it was um, taken uh, by King Leopold of Belgium as a personal treasure trove, and then afterwards as part of the Belgian Free State. In 1960, it gained independence from Belgium, but uh, the internal discord quickly takes hold. Um, the newly elected government um, is led by a man called Patrice Lumumba, who you may also be familiar with. Lumumba emerges uh, as a very characteristic and very charismatic leader. He's one of the few African politicians, as many historians have claimed, that was actually able to unite the many different uh, gr political groups, but also many different ethnicities. Upon independence, of course, the Congolese people spoke a multitude, and, and that is hundreds and hundreds of different languages. So political unity was difficult internally from the beginning. But what exacerbated the problem really was that uh, when the kind of law and order broke down very quickly after independence, Belgium sent in paratroopers to protect the European civilians around the major cities. And this was obviously received by the Congolese people and importantly by other African countries as an act of imperialism, as um, an example of the perils of decolonization whereby former colonial powers could just very directly interfere once again. When that happened, of course, Lumumba appealed to the UN to send in a peacekeeping force to maintain law and order. Um, this all got a little bit worse uh, a week after independence when that southeastern province that you can see on the map, Katanga, seceded. Now, Katanga and the neighboring province of Kasai was and remains to be the place where most of the strategic materials are located. 
and again, they are processed by companies that are based in Belgium and in Britain, and to a lesser extent in the United States. And that continues to be the case today. So you have many different actors in this kind of soup of conflict. You have the internal Congo Congolese problem, you have the external problem of um, the interests of other countries in those resources, you have the deep economic colonial networks that continue to dominate the relationship between Europe and the Congo. And then on top of that, you have the Cold War. Now, a lot of literature has been devoted to the interests of the State Department in the Congo as being explained largely by the fear of the spread of communism throughout Africa if they manage to you know, grab hold of the Congo. To a certain extent, there's also the argument made that the United States did not want the uranium that they had used to create their first atomic bomb, which came from the Congo, to be seized by the Russians. Russian historians argue that the Congo is very far geographically from Russia and that thereby, therefore, really, Khrushchev wasn't prepared to commit huge amounts of resources, money, materials, or men to fight the ideological battle for, for between communism and, and capitalism in the Congo. But nonetheless, the United States really viewed Congo increasingly during this period as an important um, area or arena for US foreign policy. And you see in the beginning, um, the book traces the relationship between various factions in the State Department as they debate what the American Congo policy should be. And then gradually, gradually, you see the Americans becoming more and more active at the UN, developing a more coherent strategy. And a lot of this is based on intelligence that they gather from the CIA, who are all over the Congo. So this is kind of the overview of what the United States tries to do. So the Congo crisis continues for four years. The UN peacekeeping force um, has a controversial and checkered record in the Congo. Um, they do manage to end the secession of Katanga by military means, but this requires two precedents, two precedences. The first one is that they are authorized for the first time in February 1961 to use force in self-defense. And the mandate that's given from New York is very open. So it's largely left open to the peacekeepers on the ground to interpret how to use force in self-defense. And when they do that, and this is the second precedent that the peacekeeping mission establishes, they end up defending the interests of the central government in Leopoldville or Kinshasa, as it's now called. So you have the two violations of those elements of peacekeeping. Firstly, using force in controversial circumstances, and then secondly, violating that neutrality principle. And this really draws the peacekeeping mission and the UN, which at that point is a particularly interesting and dynamic body, uh, into controversy. Now, to say what, what, so these are things that we know about the Congo. This is what has happened, and a lot of the literature covers this ground. There's kind of three main claims in my book. So I'm trying to stay a little bit away from the Cold War story, because I think that the Congo is actually much more interesting as a lightning rod for the interaction of Cold War with decolonization questions. And in particular, the spillover effects of the Congo into wider debates at the UN about the nature of decolonization, the pace of decolonization, and what issues get classed as questions for decolonization. So it's, it, it evolves during the Congo as being not just the question of the acquisition and the protection of sovereignty, but also the question of economic sovereignty, the question of social and economic rights, the question of development, and to a lesser extent, the question of racial relations between uh, the West and the Global South countries, um, and the question of how that emerges during these discussions. It also raises major questions over the role of the UN in managing the process of decolonization. So going beyond the non-self-governing territories committee, uh, looking at the fourth committee, what I'm trying to do is to think about why this was an important moment for the UN because of the questions and the issues that Congo raises within that kind of specter of decolonization. So let me talk a little bit more generally about the UN and how it's represented here and how I see it. Um, oftentimes, again, the UN is very much diminished in history and to a, to a certain extent also still today when we think about the way the UN is represented. It's constantly represented as the Security Council does this or doesn't do this and therefore that's what the UN does. But many experts of the UN, as I'm sure you all are, will know that the UN is a much more dynamic and much more 
active body. That, and that activism really doesn't get recorded very well, certainly not in the history. So in thinking about that problem, I try to think of the UN as having three separate but interlinked dimensions. The first one is as a public platform, the second one as a socializing space, and the third one as an actor in the Congo. Um, I've just put in that photo of Nasiri Kosta up there at the General Assembly, um, and this is with this famous image where he stops the General Assembly debate on the Congo by banging his shoe on the table. Um, and I think it's interesting um, because it's reflective of the kind of impassioned debates that we had during the Congo crisis at the General Assembly. So much so that the, the, you know, the normal rules of diplomacy become violated by the activists because they're so incensed with what's happening. So let me quickly run through these six, three dimensions. Um, the public platform obviously is the first one. And there is you know, certainly this idea that the UN starts to become a very important avenue for public diplomacy during these years. And that's partially due to the rise of the Afro-Asian bloc, which is um, reinvigorated with new members who emerge um, from the yoke of colonialism. But it's also because the kind of whole idea that the Western view of the world that dominated the UN up until that point comes under fire. And that's to do with um, the rhetoric and the speeches that are used by Afro-Asian members, um, particularly against the West. Um, and this is very, very damaging for the United States to the extent that it becomes cast as the, not colonial power, but certainly imperialistic in its view of the world. And despite the many speeches that UN, US representatives make about the anti-colonialism of US policy at the UN, the fact that they're voting with the Europeans on colonial questions um, really becomes an issue. Um, but it, so it becomes this kind of forum for damaging rhetoric. And Thomas Kanza, who's pictured there, he was uh, Lumumba's chief UN representative. He gives you know, some very, very interesting speeches and has written a lot about how the UN works in this regard. Um, the second part that obviously is most interesting for the peacekeeping element is the UN intervention. Ham Jack Hammarskjöld was the Secretary General during this period. Um, he has long been lauded as the most active Secretary General the UN has ever had. And he certainly had an activist view of what the UN should do. He believed the UN should use its capacity for agency in activating the peacekeeping mission. Um, but he creates controversy in the way he, he, he kind of activates the secretariat. He has huge disagreements and public breaks with the US, which is the first time that that's ever happened since the UN was created. Um, and he, he is, of course, um, killed in mysterious circumstances in the middle of the crisis, which raises all kinds of questions about the financial and political cost of the partisan UN campaign that he organized. Finally, I started to think about the UN as a socializing space. So a space where Western delegates were forced to interact and to seriously engage with the views of Global South leaders about decolonization. And a lot of this emerges in the debates that take place about the, the Congo crisis, and particularly the, the spillover effect into the questions on the Fourth Committee and the Committee of 24. Um, so we see here that the visions of decolonization and what it should be and how it should take place start to collide very much um, during these debates. Um, and that's an image of the Security Council um, debate, Hammarskjöld looking a bit frustrated and kind of fed up there. And I think that gives a sense also of, you know, it was a very dynamic environment, but it was also extremely tenuous. There were long debates that went for weeks and weeks and weeks on very small issues with regard to the mandate. What, why was the US interested in this? I mean, they didn't have a large amount of economic you know, interest in the Congo beyond kind of vague associations with some of the big mining companies. They didn't need any more of the uranium for their nuclear program. And so that's the question that I've most often been asked when I talk about the book um, to an American audience. Um, and I think it's, it's a couple of different things. Firstly, the whole Cold War lens causes the US to securitize the challenges of decolonization. Uh, and this isn't just limited, of course, to Congo or just to Africa, but also to the Vietnam War. And they're engaged in Vietnam very heavily during this period. So there, to a certain extent, there's a large fear that they can't handle another out-and-out -out war to uh, take place in the Congo. Um, there's also a question of the balance with the domestic race problem. Um, and that civil um, campaign that takes place here um, on racial questions uh, really gets energy from the whole Congo debate. Um, and many uh, civil rights activists considered American foreign policy abroad to be reflective of race attitudes at home. And that squeezes Kennedy and particularly Johnson in the latter half of the crisis. 
There's also a lack of coordinated strategy. The State Department is internally divided between the Europeanists who want to preserve Western unity at the UN and good relationship with the former colonial powers, and then the Africanists or the alternative group who really believe that a policy of engagement with the third world is the way forward. And that really also causes a problem in developing a coordinated strategy. I also focus a little bit on the British position. Um, again, there is domestic pressures on um, the British Prime Minister, Harold Macmillan, because a lot of his backbenchers in the Conservative Party are heavily invested, or as it's put in one UN report, up to their necks in Congolese money. And it's Congolese money, but it's based on Congolese resources. So Harold Macmillan has pressure um, about the British position, which is basically to just stick their heads in the sand and hope that nothing happens. The British are strongly and adamantly and outrightly opposed to the use of force by the UN to end the secession of Katanga. And that's a serious difference of opinion that they have from the United States who want to empower the UN to end the conflict as quickly as possible. Um, they also come under widespread fire for their longer colonial history. The UN is seen to be threatening to the neighboring British colonies, um, but it also largely interferes with their plans for decolonization. They also, of course, have you know, extremely um, interesting and complicated relationships with Shell and Unilever and another Belgian financial group called Union Minière um, who process the resources in Katanga. So the British are really in a difficult position throughout the crisis. Now, how does this really impact on that whole idea of the UN as an ordering force? Well, firstly, the Congo crisis with its many interlinked and interacting dimensions becomes a microcosm of the wider ideological debate about the relationship between the Afro-Asian world, or the third world of the global south, um, and the rest, the West, the rest of the world. Um, and that's a, a debate that continues between the, the merits of communism versus capitalism, nationalism versus internationalism, imperialism versus anti-colonialism. Um, and it really reflects a lot of those trends, which are you know, relevant to a large area of the world. Um, who, that finally get representation uh, at the UN. It's a fundamental turning point, really, for decolonization because the Afro-Asians are very active in developing the UN. They reinvigorate the fourth committee. They develop um, the Committee of 24, uh, which is a special political and decolonization committee. They're not very inventive with the names of the committees, you know, which is unfortunate when you're in the archives. But they are very active in thinking about how to change the UN and make it into something that will be useful for their aims. And if you see what they do through the 60s and the 70s with the campaign for development, the campaign for the new international economic order, they really are effective, not in changing the world order, but in putting their own views forward and in utilizing and changing the UN in order to try to, to realize those views. So the whole crisis then elucidates a third world or global south solidarity and critique. And that's also important. It's not just that the Afro-Asian countries, and I say Afro-Asian because even the African and Asian countries who contribute to, to the UN mission are united in what they think about the Congo, but also the Latin American countries, many of them share the views, and they sponsor resolutions in the General Assembly. So you have the beginning of that global size dynamic that now we recognize very clearly as being something of the 60s and 70s, but actually it begins um, with the Congo crisis. Now that's not saying that there's a homogenous block there. There are disagreements about what the Congo means and what it should you know, kind of reify for them. But it starts that dynamic very actively. Um, and so finally, you know, the US also revises its vision of the utility of the UN. They go from a very passive position to thinking about the UN as something that's very important, um, as something that really requires their attention. And they formulate a very clear strategy for thinking about what their US policy should be there. Um, and so overall, what we see then is that between, in that struggle between the global south and the west, the Afro-Asians managed to use the Congo experience as a way to challenge the liberal imperial internationalism um, of the Anglo-Americans in the Congo, but also in Africa. So I think I'll leave it there for now. And of course, I'm very interested in hearing your questions. So thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I think it was good to have an overview of some of the points on the book and your talent for this. So I'm going to copy off.
expensive. Plus, all three of these are coming in from all over the East and really back and forth. It's important to keep in mind the context of uh, the Cold War, Reagan power politics, and what we're seeing in the United States. Let us uh, now hear from my colleague, uh, Dr. Bruce Kerr. All right, thank you, Richard, and uh, thank you, Dr. Amali. Um, I learned a lot about the diplomacy of the Congo and, uh, and the mission, and global politics for that matter, in, in reading this book. Um, the interaction of the Cold War and decolonization uh, and the evolution of North-South relations. Um, I followed the military operational uh, elements of, of ONA, the mission in Congo, more closely than the diplomacy, obviously, when I was doing my own work on this some time ago. And I, in reading it, I was struck by what has changed and what hasn't changed uh, in uh, Congolese politics, regional politics, global politics. Um, in the politics of the UN, uh, the bipolar, bipolar Cold War era versus uh, an emerging North-South uh, struggle versus a multipolar, multi-political, global tension arena, I guess you would call it today fueled by, a, in part, I think, a global population. We need to remember it's two and a half times larger today than it was in 1960. In a population in Africa, it is four times larger than it was in 1960. A DRC population that was then 15 million and is now somewhere estimated to be 78 million people. Okay. A, a lot of people. And today, in the last 10 years, the UN has had a mission in Congo about the same size as the mission it had in, in 1960 and 62. Okay. So this, this makes a difference. And it isn't clear that the, the infrastructure in the Congo is much better now than it was then because under Mobutu for 30 years it was basically in a, in a political and economic time warp um, with Mobutu and his family and friends skimming off the top. Peacekeeping infrastructure has changed dramatically in 40 years. In, in 1960, it was Dag Harmerschold and his kitchen cabinet of four or five advisors making all of the decisions, as, as the book explains. And now we have, in addition to the intergovernmental bodies, the Secretariat has several thousand people in the Department of Peacekeeping Operations and Field Support. And they support 110, 120,000 uh, civilians and military folks in, in the field. They have... Um, it had essentially no logistics or command and control structure when the, the, the mission first deployed in 1960. Now there's a regional uh, logistics hub in, in Tebe, Uganda. And that's partly because uh, the UN has gone from a sort of no precedent, never to be repeated if possible operation in the Congo to what has become in the last 15 years routine deployments in equally difficult missions all over Central and Western and, and, and Southern Africa hence the Entebbe base. Um, as in 1960, most of the operational focus in the Congo has been in the east, headquarters in Kinshasa, and the real action a thousand kilometers away. Uh, as I think the, the book points out and others have always pointed out, it's easier to get to the eastern Congo from someplace else than it is from the capital of the Congo. Um, the out-of-capital out focus, of course, in, in the 1960s was Katanga in the south, and more recently it has been in the east, first in Ituri up in the northeast on the Ugandan border, then in the Kivus, and now kind of it's becoming more unstable now again in, in Katanga. So the east has always been, the whole Rift Valley has been the source of most of the, most of the resources and most of the political rifts. In 64, the UN left the Congo unstabilized. Since 2003, it has been unwilling or unable to do so. That, that is, to leave Congo unstabilized once again. So it has been there now for 18 years, uh, of which maybe 15, 14 of those have been a fairly robust military presence. Congolese politics is as fragile and corruption prone as it ever has been. Natural resources remain a common focus of political maneuvering and crime, as Dr. O'Malley mentioned. The neighboring states, most of which gained independence while ONIC was deployed, especially around the east and south, um, continue to operate according to, of course, their best interests, usually not in the DRC's best interests. 
um, however difficult that may be to define. So the, and the great powers today um, have other fish to fry. Cold War type ideological struggles and colonial politics no longer dominate major power decision making, but the impact uh, of Congo dropping out as a central focus of global politics has probably been at least as damaging to its people as having been the focus of the global spotlight uh, 40 years ago. So it has swung in the, in the, the pendulum has swung in the total opposite uh, direction. The manipulative roles of the major powers have been replaced by the machinations of the neighbors and the, and the tug of, of major resource markets. And as a final comment, also the U.S. role, uh, as the book ably uh, describes, the, the Congo crisis helped to actually um, hone the U.S. approach to decolonization and, and uh, the change of administrations from Eisenhower to Kennedy produced a much more energetic policy that kind of used the Congo and the UN as a fulcrum and the UN as a tool, uh, which is actually interesting to me to read and, and have re-emphasized given how odd our relations have been with the, with the UN for the last 10 to 15 uh, years. The U.S. paid for half the Congo operation and bought at least half of the bonds that were floated in, in the early 60s to help fund it. The U.N. actually had to go out with a tin cup because they couldn't figure out how to pay for this uh, event. And, and there was no other U.N.-funded major operation launched for 10 years uh, until the post-Yom Kippur War operations in the, in the Middle East. The U.S. transport system, which was devised to carry thousands of troops to the Western European theater in case the Warsaw Pact attacked and started World War III was used to bring all those troops into the Congo, which is why the, the UN could have four to six to 9,000 troops on the ground in two weeks because we had all these aircraft and we could just fly people everywhere. And we, I think we flew the Swedes down to Katanga to start with along with Hammarskjöld. The internal logistics uh, were mostly carried by other, other contributors, but um, the, la the UN's lack of, of logistical capability was made up for by, largely by the United States. But the United States couldn't provide the kind of coherent command structure that an operation like this needs. And, and the book is very good at pointing out how the confused civilian military chains of command ended up getting some very strange outcomes, including the last uh, use of force, I think, would be interesting to talk about some more. So I think I'll leave it at that, and it's, a, it's an interesting time. It has lessons for all of us, and <laughs> those lessons are still bubbling up in the same places today, which is also, I guess, a lesson. As you go, it's very uh, microphone issue. Oh. <laughs> hear us on the live stream, and we'll be passing around a microphone in a minute to hear your questions and comments, so start thinking about those. Uh, but first, uh, we'll turn it over to Alana. It's, it's really important in our conversation, as Bill highlighted, not only how important this uh, mission was for the UN and uh, really a pioneering uh, set of activities in, a, in a, a very challenging part of the world in the early 60s, but how the US contribution, just financially, as we just heard from Bill, was quite significant. So really the beginning of US uh, back support for what has become uh, so much more prominent in the post-Cold War era, that being UN peacekeeping. Alana. So firstly, thank you very much, um, Bill, for your um, excellent comments and for reading the whole book, which is a bit scary for me because you're the best person to read it. Um, so I, I think you made some interesting points, and they're the things that I didn't talk about in my presentation. Um, you know, historians can sometimes just like to stay in the bubble of history. But it is very interesting when you talk about or think about the legacy of this for the UN. Um, you said that the mission, no large mission was launched again for 10 more years. And I would go further and say that no peacekeeping mission on this scale is actually launched again until the end of the Cold War. Because of course, the, the Yonkin 4 mission is very different in the mandate than we have um, seen in the Congo. Um, so I think the kind of tentacles of this crisis, you know, sowed this fear amongst UN member states, and not just the United States or the major powers, but also among the African countries. I mean, they were the ones who contributed large amounts of troops who got mown down um, by the Katangan Gendarmerie, who fought the UN um, peacekeepers on the ground, also by the, uh, the Army National Congolese, the, the Congolese National Army, right, who also opposed the UN mission. 
And a lot of people, um, if you spoke to them, Congolese people, would say that they wish the UN had never come to the Congo, that it was much better, their, their lives were much uh, more peaceful when the, um, the Belgian colonial system was there. You know, these are people, indigenous people who could survive and, and live through this period. Um, so I think it's an interesting um, kind of black spot, if you like, on the UN record. And that's what kind of drew me to it. And what is interesting also now is that the UN still appears not to have learned the lessons from the Congo crisis, if you look at what MONUSCO tries to do now. It's underfunded, they don't have uh, enough troops, they don't have enough supplies. You hear crazy stories of troops being you know, isolated in parts of the Congo, but also in neighboring missions in Mali, where they're not some uh, troops cannot connect together. It takes days and days to drive to get to a satellite phone when they want supplies. I mean, all kinds of logistical questions that have emerged that you see on a kind of perhaps a different technological level in the Congo in the 60s, but similar logistical challenges that they have now. Um, and so that's an issue, the question I suppose, why not? Why, it, when all that's been written about the Congo military mission, why hasn't there been someone who's made a list of 10 points and said these are the things that we should not be still allowing to happen? Um, it's also really, for me, been turned around by a lot of the, the stuff that's been written about it. The people constantly, when they talk about Congo now, they still use this very outdated and very prejudicial language. They, they, I read an article last week about the current uprising in Kivu, where they talked about the Congolese being witch doctors and believing in magic medicine and all this kind of stuff. I mean, somehow we've also not learned the relevance of the difficulties of managing relations by recognizing the agency of African actors and not casting them in public forums as these figures of ridicule. Um, and, and that's a kind of a, an irritant I have when I sometimes read now what's written about um, the Congo and about the current conflict. Um, and so we also then have the interference, if you like, or the opinions of the neighboring African states. I mean, Paul Tagame has come out and said that the UN also should never have interfered in 1960. I mean, he has his own reasons for cutting across this point. But so I think there's a problem with the way the mission has been understood militarily, but also politically. And that affects current relations, both at the UN, but also directly with the Congo and the Congolese people, I think in very clear ways. So I'll just leave it there. Thanks very much for Thank you, Alana. So at this point, uh, we will be passing around the microphone. I need to keep the spotlight on that I'm understood, but please do speak into the microphone from my, co oh, uh, our colleague Caitlin will be bringing to you. Introduce yourself briefly and then uh, kindly ask a question or, uh, or share a comment on the presentations you've just heard. I'm very uh, thankful that uh, we didn't announce this earlier, but we have the president of our local chapter of UNA NCA here, Stephen Mosley, who I'm expecting a, a, a strong question early on uh, to get our, keep our discussion going. And then the co-chair of the Peace and Security Committee and, and former uh, president of the local chapter, Don Bliss, who many of you know, is also with us today. So thank you, Don and Stephen, for being here. So unless I see a first question and my colleague, Aditi, colleague, oh, We'll start over here, and then we'll hear from Aditi. Please, kindly introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Ed Elmendorf, also from the UN Association. I, it, it happened that I was a junior foreign service officer in the 1960s, and I served at the US mission to the UN from 1963 to 67. So I was an observer of quite a, quite a bit of this, even if engaged on the periphery. Two things seem to me to be absent from the commentary, at least. I can't say whether they're absent from the book. The first one is the interaction with Belgium and Belgium's, Belgium's role. And, and the second is uh, the emerging crises in financing of the UN and Article 19 of the UN Charter, which gradually came to overshadow much of the US and other countries' reactions to the UN. Uh, let me offer then a question for, uh, for the two of you, really. The lessons for today from this experience, particularly as, as I observe now from a much greater distance, the continuing chaos in, in the Congo, um, it, it's, if, would it be desirable in some way to reinstitute some of the structures that existed a long time ago under which, well, for lack of a better term, colonial powers, uh, 
had, had major uh, roles. We clearly don't want a colonial world. We don't want an imperial world. And I, I think the UN is the only substitute we've got for that. And we see now in, in the UN a very halting effort to, to deal with some of these problems because the UN's major members and its smaller members are not really ready to give the UN the authority to do this kind of thing, I think. And before, I, and we have an in, intimate enough group here that we can, I think, uh, hear immediately from our speakers, but to clarify on the question, are you speaking to the trusteeship role? Uh, that is all but defunct it's since 94. I, I, I don't like to use that kind of terminology, and so maybe it's really about increasingly empowering the UN to Great. Thank you, Ed. Alana and then Bill. Uh, thank you for a fascinating question. Um, very briefly, I didn't talk about Belgium because there's mountains of books written about Belgium. Belgium is in the book, but I haven't focused on it because, uh, well, we've, I feel that that story has very much been told. Um, and I did go to the Belgian archives and had an interesting experience because at least when I walked in there and said, can I see the files on Congo, they said, Congo? Sorry, what? No, we don't have any files. Maybe. So they're very protective of the, the, the records um, that they have after 1960, right? Up until then, you can see everything. Um, so that's basically why Belgium isn't in there. Um, I also needed a way to, to, there's so many actors in the Congo, I had to kind of cut something. The financing question, it's dealt with to a certain extent in the book. Um, certainly, it was at the back of the minds of a lot of the major players. And what's interesting is that even the countries who didn't support the mission bought the UN bonds because they wanted to show that they were still with the UN, even though they disagree with what was happening in the Congo. Um, and so that was definitely a feature. Um, but I mean, to a certain extent, also, by the time this emerges, the UN is so in, in the Congo, it's, it's so deeply involved that this is something that this has to solve. Um, but I do agree that it, it colored the impressions of other countries. Um, in terms of the lessons, um, you know, I, I really feel that two things are important. Um, firstly, history is not just something that we learn lessons from, right? And that's just really important to, to say, um, at least in my view. But that it just teaches us to ask the right kind of questions now. Um, and the question that this raises is, um, why have we not empowered the UN to be more actively in independent or to take some autonomous decisions on questions such as the Congo where we, there isn't a political solution because it's about money because there's so many material and wealthy financial interests there that even when they reach a ceasefire, they fund another militia group to oppose that. And, and this is why we have constant conflict. So because the big powers aren't interested, and even the small powers are, are, aren't interested in peace because war is more beneficial to their interests, I think that's part of the reason there isn't a solution. And why we haven't authorized the UN to do that because nobody, I think, really wants the UN to solve the problem. Congolese people, I presume, would like to have peace, but is there anyone who's going to take that question to the UN and get, you know, a, a consolidated position and drive this home? I don't know, and that's, that's a real loss, because here we see the problems of autonomy, but we could also see it as something that has been innovative for the UN, it's something that we could repeat with better safeguards, so. Bill, would you like to add? Yeah, just a little bit. Um, on the, on the money issue, uh, there was no Warsaw Pact funding at all for, for the Congo crisis, as there had been no Warsaw Pact funding for um, the first Sinai mission, UNAF-1, in the, in the 50s. And uh, France refused to pay its share for the Congo. And because peacekeeping was then paid out of the regular UN budget, it fell under the strictures of Article 19, which says we can kick out deadbeats from the GA if, if we choose to. And because there was two permanent members of the Security Council involved in this problem, the General Assembly just kind of agreed to mumble, uh, I think, on, on this issue and it never really, uh, never really came up. Um, in terms of, of um, oh yeah, and it was a $100 million bond issue in 1962, was it 62? It was a 20, 25 year, 30 year, 20, 20 year bond issue. And the final payments came due in the 1980s, and at that point, the U.S. Congress forbade the U.S. from 
participating in, in any new bond issues, and if there were any bond issues, we'd withhold our dues. So, so we put the kibosh on the UN being able to do anything in security on credit, uh, unlike the US government, which pretty much runs on credit, as, as we know, and we can't seem to get out of the habit. So it's, it's at best ironic uh, there. Um, in terms of empowering the UN, well, we know all the big states are afraid of losing leverage to an empowered UN, and all the small states are afraid of being overrun by a UN that's run by the big states. So it, it's a bit of an impasse, and I think <clears throat> historically the countries that have been the most friendly to and interested in the UN are kind of the middle developed powers who are neither running things nor feeling totally helpless and without money. Thank you. Great. Now we'll hear from the colleague Aditi Gurur. Uh, thanks so much. Aditi with the Stimson Center. Um, thanks so much, uh, Dr. O'Malley. Uh, I'm really looking forward to reading the book. Um, it struck me during your comments that you, know, you, you really emphasize the role of natural resources as the, one of the drivers of the conflict, um, but then didn't really, um, that, that theme didn't really seem to come out in terms of the diplomatic response to the crisis. And you started to answer this question um, in your response to the last question, but I was just wondering, I mean, it's not, it's not exactly fair to say that there's nothing uh, diplomacy can do to address a resource-driven conflict, right? Um, so I'm wondering if you can elaborate a bit more on you know, whether the subject of natural resources came up at all in the diplomatic uh, discussions and, and how, you know, um, whether you did see any sort of uh, glimmers of hope for how diplomacy can try and address these sorts of natural uh, resource-driven conflicts. And then, Bill, I wonder if, as you were reading the book, you had any thoughts about what either the, the UN Security Council or, uh, you know, the UN Secretariat or missions uh, might do differently in responding to uh, conflicts that are driven in part by natural resources. Thank you, Aditi. Alana. Um, thank you for the great question. And I have thought a lot about natural resources today without really connecting it to diplomacy, so thanks for uh, casting me on that. Um, and yes, they are very important in the conflict, and they do get brought into diplomacy, um, and that's in three main ways. Firstly, the UN sends um, a commission to survey uh, not so much the resources just in the Congo, but also along the whole copper belt uh, in Africa, um, which is just to the east of Katanga. Um, and that extends then down from there into South Africa. And they come up with this phrase um, that they, they report back to the General Assembly, which is a very long report detailing who owns what, where the resources are, and, and how they're processed. And they say that the Anglo-American powers are really literally up to their neck in Congolese resources, but also across Southern Africa. And that's why there, there's, there's so much concern about the control of those resources, because these companies are rooted across the region, not just across Africa. And the shareholders are involved in two ways. So they are in the government in Britain, that's a major issue, um, but they also are in the government in the Congo, and they send lots of what they call political advisors to the Congo throughout the crisis to advise the government how to solve the crisis with Katanga. They advise Katanga how to retain their independence, and they constantly you know, steer Congolese politics towards Western ambitions. Now, the second way um, that we see this coming into diplomacy, and perhaps in a more interesting way, is that other African countries are aware of this, right? So they know what these companies do and how they're connected politically to the idea. Um, and they launch a kind of parallel campaign that I talk a little bit about in the book. And that's the campaign to secure the resolution of the General Assembly in 1962 over the control of natural resources. And that resolution is about trying to um, delegitimize agreements with colonial agreements with companies that give them like 100 year claims over large swathes of territory to take over resources. So they try to rewrite those claims, but also they try increasingly, and this goes on after the Congo, to use the General Assembly to condemn the behavior of these companies. And the companies are named in General Assembly resolutions sometimes, but also to try to increasingly freeze them, right? To try to delegitimize their activities without disrupting the flow of money. And a, a large part of the campaign at the UN is also about getting these companies to give the money to the central government, not to shareholders in Belgium and in Britain. So it, I think it actually comes quite well into diplomacy. Again, you see a lot of innovative resolutions that, that happen because of the Congo experience on that question. 
And asking our colleague, uh, Dr. Dirch, to respond, I hope since we've done some research recently on this, if you could mention what current tools might have meant for uh, Congo in the early 60s, such as the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative or the Kimberley Process on Conflict Diamonds. <clears throat> I'm not actually sure the, the, <laughs> the, the current processes could have done a whole lot uh, for Congo. Um, and the political situation is so different that I'm not really sure you could, you could transcribe it onto that situation without changing it to the one we have now. Uh, but what I was going to say um, was that the, uh, the UN's tools for dealing with these kinds of problems are, are primarily, I think, sanctions regimes from the, from the Security Council. And since 2000, there have been a series of, and, and increasingly it's become routine, that, that the Security Council appoint groups of experts uh, to monitor and report back, investigate and report back on uh, the violations of UN sanctions. And I think recently there were one or two members of the Congo group of experts were murdered on, 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 on mission in, in southern Congo, uh, doing exactly what they were supposed to be doing. I think maybe where the system comes up, uh, and I, I commend those reports to anyone who wants to, to read them, I think where the system comes up short is in, in applying sanctions to, violator, to violators, right? It's just kind of, okay, they violated, all right, let's move on. Sometimes it's a private actor, sometimes it's a state, sometimes it's the leaders of a state. The UN would do well to, I think, routinize that investigative capacity, and that would involve, unfortunately, the development of, of more of a uh, you know, intelligence capacity at the UN with respect to sanctions regimes. And for the same reasons I listed before about empowering the UN, that's subject to resistance. The, the groups of experts have managed to kind of slide under the radar, as it were, because they are appointed on a case-by-case -case basis and not uh, and for a, a fixed amount of time. We have about 20 minutes, and I want to make sure we hear from everybody that uh, would like to say something. So let's take three at a time. Uh, please kindly keep questions or comments relatively brief, but do introduce yourself and do take the microphone before saying words. Please, we'll start here, and then uh, the gentleman to your right. Uh, Doug Brooks, International Stability Operations Association. We're the private sector who supports peacekeeping today. Uh, for either of you, but maybe Bill might be better place to answer this. Um, did uh, Urquhart and Ricky, the sort of founders or designers of peacekeeping, did they ever do an analysis of Congo and sort of come up with what worked, what didn't work? Thank you, Douglas. Professor Weiss. <coughs> well, I really would like to make a comment rather than ask a question, if that's okay. Please. And first of all, I'd like to con congratulate the author for devoting time and research to this subject, which I think uh, has been incredibly understudied. Uh, on the other hand, the notion that one can, 60 years after the event, draw lessons strikes me as rather fatuous, especially given the particular characteristics of this particular crisis. So I'd like to just very quickly, I, you know, first of all, I should say, uh, I arrived in uh, Leopoldville in December of 1959. I lived through this whole crisis. I knew all these people, bunch and uh, all the way down in the UN, although my focus was not at all this. My focus was the independent struggle. Prior to that, I'd been with INR, with the uh, intelligence and research uh, department at the State Department dealing with Francophone Africa. Um, the most important thing, I think, when you go back in history to deal with this and the whole Western or ex external sudden parachuting into this environment is the incredible level of ignorance all the way down from Hammarskjöld, from the top State Department. Uh, maybe the French and the Belgians knew what they were doing. Uh, it, it, you have no idea how ignorant people were. Uh, I was in uh, on good terms with some of the Onuk people. Um, very secretly, they passed me 
uh, you mustn't show it to anyone else, an ethnic map of the Congo. Any Congolese high school student could have done better. And I, I'm not, this is, this is literally true. Um, I was in the State Department when all the French countries were, be, were beginning to move towards independence in 58. I was at a high level meeting and one of the top officials said, well, if this goes on, we're gonna have to put embassies up trees to, to, to speak about a balance between the European Bureau and an African Bureau that didn't even exist then yet, was about to be created, is an absurdity. The Africanists had no influence. Everything was run through the European Bureau and European visions. The, the, the second concern I have are mistakes, which of course are a logical consequence of what I just said. The, the mistakes made were horrendous. Let us just take, on the one hand, what was the mistake with regards to Lumumba, and then what was the cost of that mistake, if I have enough time to. If you summarize in a minute, we'd appreciate it. <laughs> So Lumumba was quickly identified as an enemy. Why? Because the Belgians didn't like him. Lumumba did backwards somersaults to get on the good terms of the Americans. I'm going to ask you all a question. How many of you realize that four days after, no, 10 days after independence, Lumumba, Lumumba's government, formally, in a written demarche, sent the United States a request to send 3,000 American troops to the Congo. How many of you know that? Only one person knows that? How many of you know that a so-called Wall Street financier came to the Congo in the summer, early, early July, very elegant guy with a very elegant secretary. Um, Detweiler was his name. And Lumumba sold him or gave him a contract, three pages long in detail, giving him the right to develop all of Congo's mineral resources for the next 50 years. How many of you know that? You're either you're not playing my game <laughs> or, or you're even more ignorant than I thought you would be. <laughs> How much? How much what? Well, he didn't pay anything. He didn't pay anything. He was, going to, he was going to develop it and then there was an agreement on, on the uh, royalties, etc. According to a Belgian economist friend of mine, you can take that with a grain of salt if you like, <laughs> the terms the were worse than the Belgian terms. Now, this guy, what was the, all right, I'll just end with this. What was the cost of getting rid of Lumumba? The development of the largest post-independence revolutionary movement in Africa at the time and probably ever. And what did it cost us? The creation of a secret CIA Air Force, the paying for God knows how many white mercenaries, not of heavy price to get rid of a rebellion, cost the Congolese one million of their citizens. So my history is not this fiddle and that fiddle of the UN. It is the incredible opportunity 
lost to the United States to become the dominant sphere of influence power in Central Africa and to develop an area with mind-boggling mineral resources. And we threw that away. Why? And there's a book that's recently been published that at last gives us an answer. Thank you so much, Professor Rich, for those very deep reflections. And we're, I'm sure we're going to be able to continue our discussion after uh, today's session as well. Uh, Stephen Mosley, please. Right. Thanks very much. Um, thank you for being a historian also able to project some of the uh, historical findings and, and, and research onto where we are today. I think that's very valuable. I'm looking forward to reading the book. And I think you should uh, make an addendum to make that list of 10 specific lessons learned that could be uh, put before our community and, um, and maybe at the UN to uh, highlight uh, the findings. Um, I think you've uncovered a really important, and a number of people have referred to it, but that is the, the corporate engagement and role. We're calling it natural resources. Um, but they're very particular processes by which corporations work very hard to participate and did then and through the 60s and 70s in many, many countries. And, um, and it, it turned a lot of uh, political independence on its head in that, in that process. I'd argue that still goes on today. And, and the reason I bring this up um, and, and want to focus on it more is with the advent of today's sustainable development goals and in the absence of any clear path to how you fund and make uh, fine implementation of those goals, the UN has called for strong participation of the private sector, which from a beneficent standpoint may be a very helpful thing. Um, but most corporate social responsibility has a price to pay at the same time. And there's a great deal of eagerness in, in, in many senses for participation by them in the future 15 to 20 years of development. But I'm, I'm interested, uh, aren't there some lessons from this or can we extrapolate lessons and some of the corollary lessons that we've seen over the last two decades as China sees natural resources from Africa primarily, really basic natural resources, uh, amalgamating land for production to feed the people in China and, and making arrangements, Saudi Arabia is as well since they have little arid land are making huge arrangements for, with Ethiopia, for example, to feed their people, but at the expense of the Ethiopians, at the expense of the East Africans in the case of China. So here we have a new paradigm that really may have as great or greater an influence on the well-being of development processes, including ones which were put together by grassroots orientation by these very countries and areas, but where the implementation may be dependent upon the biggest corporations in the world to be partners, and I don't know quite how that's going to work well. So I'm asking you as a historian maybe to project uh, your, some of your own views about how we, we bridge this, these lessons from the Congo a very long time ago um, to maybe today um, where the greatest opportunity for the UN to succeed for the future are the SDGs, but how to pay for them may depend upon finding new relationships with corporations in a good way. Thank you, Steve. Thank Since you. we've had <coughs> now two questions and a comment, I'll take a third question if there is one um, before we'll hear back from our panel. Please. Um, I'm Peggy Jones, a, f a retired FSO. I was Zaire desk officer, um, and among my last responsibilities was working on UN peacekeeping operations at state. Um, just comment. As we move forward, there's a great resource constraint. When you try to mount a peacekeeping operation nowadays, where do you get the, the, the troops? And you pay them. You, they're almost like mercenaries now. Certain countries are paid to provide them. The Western powers, beginning in the 1990s, uh, uh, downsized their militaries. When the Congo Manuk was first mentioned, I actually... I did the first briefing on the Hill saying it looked like we had to do a look at a peacekeeping operation in the Congo. Uh, they went completely pale in front of me, almost fell over. But people were saying we need 100,000 troops for this. They had these crazy ideas. There's just a limit on what you can do with the peacekeeping operation, with the financial and personnel uh, constraints in the world. And I would just add at the end, the Security Council cannot oversee an active military operation. You need to have a mandate 
and then you have a multilateral force that goes in like they did in East Timor. That was the only way to do it. Great. Well, I now will hear back from Alana and Bill, and I hope uh, Bill in particular might take that last question from uh, Peggy on uh, uh, lessons for today. The um, question that requested the historical perspective on the development dimension of the UN mission in the Congo, the role of the private sector, if Alana, be sure to address that. And for both uh, Alana and Bill to address Douglas's question about um, two of the great leaders of the UN at the time, Urquhart and Ricky, what were some of their findings from this major engagement, the, the largest peace operation of its time? Uh, thanks a lot for um, those excellent questions and, and comments. Um, to, to quickly give some replies, um, did Urquhart and, and Reiki make a, an analysis of the Congo? Yes, of course, they did in an informal capacity, certainly with their memoirs and their um, reflections on the experience. But I think you, I mean, at least what I've read, especially of the report, is that you have to take it with a little bit of a grain of salt because both of these officials are very much under the illusion that Hammarskjöld is the great leader. And um, even in the reports that they present to the Congo Advisory Committee, which is the Advisory Committee on the Peacekeeping Mission, they're all kind of serving Hammarskjöld's idea of what the Congo is and what Africa is. Um, and so I'm not sure how much objective reflection they make um, in terms of the content of the mandate. Now the implementation of the mandate is another question. Um, and certainly there's a long debate that goes on after this about, you know, lessons learned is such a kind of problematic phrase, but of the experiences that they had and, and what kind of uh, details worked and what didn't. Um, and that kind of brings me to, I'm, I'm going to skip the comments for a second and go to your question, Stephen, which is about corporate engagement. Um, and the part that I didn't talk at all about here and something that I think we also need to think about is that the, the peacekeeping mission takes place, as I discussed with Bill a little bit earlier, alongside a civilian mission. And the civilian mission are the people who, uh, you know, run the sanitary programs and the food programs, but they're also the ones who are providing the political advice to the government. So ONUC and the civilian mission kind of get mingled together um, with two kind of unclear mandates. And then on top of that, you have the question of how they cooperate with the representatives of corporations on the ground. Um, and obviously, the, you know, the Belgians in particular are all over the place. And every time one of the African politicians makes a speech, he's got three or four, as I understand it, he had three or four Belgian advisors on either side of him, you know, telling him what to do. Um, and so this is how not to do it, I guess. Um, I mean, you know, again, not trying to draw too many direct lessons from so long ago, I think it's still interesting that the Congo is often thought about as the worst case scenario for a lot of different questions. Worst case for peacekeeping militarily, worst case for decolonization, worst case for independence, et cetera. Uh, but it's also not a good example for the role of the corporations um, in this. And if you look at the SDGs, but also what the UN tried to do with um, the kind of the global compact um, and the questions and ideas that we think about um, for development today, what we see is that there's an increasing responsibility on corporations because they're the ones who have the money. They're the ones who can afford to do the kind of things the UN can't afford to do. But the problem is that when the UN gets involved at that level, then it loses the objectivity and neutrality that allows agencies like UNDP to operate essential programs in these kind of areas. So there's a question of objectivity. And I think, I mean, it, what I think about is that we, we need to you know, delineate more clearly and define the relationship between global pa compact members, the you know, corporate environment of the UN, and decide, okay, we might want this from them, but we're not going to compromise. The UN shouldn't compromise in providing something else for them, right? And if they want access to tracts of land in Eastern Congo or minerals, then something, you know, that cannot be a driving motivation that we allow to happen. And I think the Obama um, administration, you know, negotiated quite well and passed some interesting um, declarations on these kinds of issues that were actually effective in the control and sale of cobalt, which is one of the major um, minerals there. So I think actually, again, Congress is a good example for this even now, but again, we're back to the problem of you know, the indistinction between the layers of the UN and how they cooperate. And I understand that all institutions have that problem, but the, the issue is that you, know, you have this internally in New York, but then you also have the World Bank, right, who have a lot of money, sponsor a lot of programs, but a very poor reputation in some areas for the kind of work that they do. Um, and the conditional 
loans that they give are easily compared to the non-conditional money that China gives for development in Africa, which a lot of African governments prefer to take. So we have a problem of distinction and definition. And again, we have a little lack of institutional structures. And in reforming the UN, that has to be central, I think, to how they think about development going forward. <laughs> yes, I just did the first one, though, and that took 10 years. So I don't know if I'll be writing another one anytime soon. Um, and I'll briefly respond to Professor Lee. Firstly, I have to say that it's an honor to have you here. And uh, I, you know, long wanted to meet you. So um, I, I would very much like to engage you at, at, much, um, at length later on uh, about all these questions. Um, I can only agree with what you said because you were there. What I would say is that, I mean, at least the records reflect some of the African and Free State Departments. Whether or not their interest is translated into policy, they're in the debate. And the ambassadors that are in the Congo, Gillian in particular, is very active in putting forward these ideas uh, about this view and the Congolese um, perspective on events. Um, so I'm not necessarily arguing in the book either that they don't, that, that it is an Africanist policy that the US designed for the Congo. But what I am saying is that there's a debate that takes place. And maybe that debate didn't take place about Africa at all before the Congo, which I don't think it did. And it's also the question of the importance of the relationship with the Afro-Asian world that isn't a feature of US foreign policy as well. They don't really care that much about those kind of issues in Vietnam, for instance, or in Southeast Asia, or, or in the Middle East. So this is a, a kind of a different perspective that I try to bring out in thinking about US foreign policy and diplomacy. But I really hope to talk to you at length. Yeah. I agree with your last point. The distinction there is the Eisenhower Kennedy. Yes. Uh, sorry. Uh, you know, which is dramatic, and uh, if you want, I can point you to some documentation on that. Um, because Kennedy, uh, first of all, had a completely different attitude towards the Third World, um, and there is relatively good evidence that Kennedy wanted to resuscitate uh, the premiership of Lumumba, and that the anticipation of that was what got him killed five days before Kennedy was inaugurated. Uh, we are sometimes, we the United States are usually uh, very often blamed for that, and I think that's unjustified. That particular, I mean, we had the intention, of course, that's public knowledge, to yeah. kill Lumumba, but earlier than that. Uh, and that failed when the famous uh, poison was dropped into the Congo River and probably killed a crocodile rather than <laughs> Lumumba. Thank you. And final comments or reflections from Bill Dirch. Um, did that work? Yes, it did. Okay. Um, just three comments uh, from several of the uh, on several of the, the observations um, in Timor. Um, the operation there after the massacres in, in 99 was initially uh, led by Australia, but almost immediately was replaced by a UN operation that was responsible for the security and governance of, of Timor for almost two years and to a lesser extent for public security for several years thereafter, as it was also true in, in Kosovo, in two very small places that could fit inside one Congolese city pretty much. Um, on, uh, on uh, the cost of, of, of being rid of, of Lumumba, um, well, we, we both know that, that U.S. operations there were fairly typical of, of U.S. foreign policy in the 50s and 60s and probably on through the end of the Cold War, and not that that excused any of it, but I think we were, we, U.S. leadership, were really afraid that Marxism was on the right side of history. And because we didn't have sufficient confidence in our own system, we felt the need to go and counter every tendril that we could spot. And that not only got us involved in the Congo in that way, but in Vietnam and in many other places that we could have saved a lot of lives by not getting involved in, in things. And then, uh, and, uh, but, and finally, your comment, I'm not quite sure I understand, fatuous to think we can draw lessons 60 years later, which kind of suggests to me that history as a profession should just give up unless it can write <laughs> contemporary journalism. Uh, you know, how proximate to events do you have to be to, to not be fatuous, and is there no prospect of, of learning at, at a distance? Um, so I just want to kind of leave things at that. A powerful note to end on. I'd like to 
warmly thank our two uh, panelists and encourage everybody to share a round of applause for both of them today. <laughs> contributions. I'd like to thank uh, all of my colleagues here at the Stimson Center and from the, the local UNA chapter for uh, contributing to today's organization. Uh, as uh, Paula noted, uh, a lot of great activities coming up and information uh, on the counter outside on how to register uh, for the UNA. Uh, with our Peace and Security Group, we actually meet here at Stimson every two months or so. Our next meeting coming up on Thursday, the 2nd of November, with uh, Don and myself and a, and a wonderful group from here in the National Capital Area. Um, if you haven't noticed from her accent or her last name, uh, Alana is from Ireland. And on this theme of Ireland, the Congo, and, and UN peacekeeping, we actually have a series going now. One of our colleagues uh, has reached out to the Irish Embassy in town for the screening of a, a very well-received documentary called The Siege of Jadedville. So we'll be alerting our members about that before uh, the end of this year uh, and have a discussion along uh, with that important documentary on Irish peacekeepers in the Congo in the 60s. Uh, a big event at the end of the year on peacekeeping reform, a hot topic, especially with talks of cuts and uh, the future of UN peacekeeping. We'll be doing that with our friends at the US Institute of Peace. So stay in touch both through uh, the newsletter uh, weekly of the UNA National Capital Area, and of course, we welcome you to uh, learn about more of the activities of the Stimson Center. Uh, all of that can be found online uh, in our regular communications through um, the uh, through the website. So, thank you once again for being here today, and uh, have a wonderful rest of the day. <laughs>